my name is Daniel Emir, so I'm, I'm from the University of Quebec, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, parsing JSON really quickly. So I'm one of the authors of what might be the fastest uh, JSON parser in the world, and so I'm going to try to tell you about the strategies we've used and give you some uh, uh, examples of the tricks that we've been uh, building up. Uh, to make uh, this possible. So I'm going to start with a relatively simple and naive question. So if I, to motivate uh, my talk, so if I give you a, a relatively large file and I ask you to read it in software, um, and then I ask you what is your limit, right? So are you limited by the performance of your disk or are you limited by uh, the performance of your processor. So I'm not going to ask for a show of and, but I would guess that most people would say that you're strictly limited by your disk. And I could uh, reframe this same question by uh, talking about network. Uh, but I would argue that uh, the story is a little bit more uh, complicated than people sometimes think. So in preparing this talk, I just benchmarked the disk on my uh, iMac, uh, which is just a basic stupid iMac on, on my desk uh, uh, on campus. And so uh, my, my disk it was rated uh, at 2.2 uh, gigabyte per second as a throughput. And, and of course, there are better disks out there. And there are uh, network adapters that are much faster, much faster also. So let, let, let's compare with uh, how quickly we can do very, very naive tasks using software. So let's say, for example, that I take a relatively large text file and I put it in memory. Now, my mem memory is probably not going to be much of a bottleneck because I can read uh, tens of uh, t tens of gigabytes per second um, in memory easily. Uh, so so let's not worry about memory, and let's try to just go through the lines in my file and just add up their length. Now this is a stupid benchmark, uh, but the point is illustrate just about the simplest thing you could do with this sort of data. And so if I benchmark it using uh, uh, a fairly standard uh, CPU, I get a fraction of a gigabyte per second uh, in, in speed. So I'm, if I were to do the same thing and my input was the disk, I would be entirely CPU bound in this case, if, if the disk is all mine and the file is large enough. Now, you can switch to... Uh, you can switch to C++, and again, I'm only using uh, rather naively uh, the standard uh, APIs. So in this case, I get, at least in my test, I get slightly better, so I, I break the one gigabyte per second barrier, uh, and uh, it's basically the same silly test. Now. My point here is not so much that I couldn't do these things much faster. So certainly, even in, in, whether you're in Java or uh, in C++, you can certainly beat these numbers. But here, I'm just trying to illustrate that if you're writing code, just standard code, you're probably going to have a tr some trouble reaching gigabytes of uh, data per, per second ingesting uh, files. Uh, now, nobody here uh, will say this, but some people could say, well, okay, but it doesn't matter because your uh, processor or your core is going to get much faster next year or in two years. That's what people used to say in the 90s. Uh, now, of course, we all know that our cores are not getting much faster with uh, each passing year. So, if we're going to reach gigabytes uh, per second processing data, we better have good software to do it. So 
course, nobody cares about uh, parsing lines of text uh, and counting their length in software. That's kind of a silly problem. But people do care about things like JSON. So I would, uh, I would assume that most people here have heard uh, of JSON, hopefully. Uh, so it's a fairly standard thing. It's well established. Uh, it's fairly simple. You have arrays, strings, numbers. Uh, it's all glued together with, uh, with some, so, so, some text. And it's all over uh, the, the public APIs and so forth. And if an entire systems are, are built around passing JSON around. So what I hear a lot, not, not from everyone, but from enough people, is that uh, they have all these, say, cool AI stuff, but their servers are just spending all their time uh, producing JSON and parsing JSON. And I see a few people laughing, so maybe this happens to you. Uh, it's kind of silly if you think about it, but that's life. So here I'm going to focus on JSON parsing. That's maybe important to define what I mean by JSON parsing because it could mean different things to different people. So what I mean here is you read all of the content, you check that it is valid as per the specification, you check, for example, that the encoding is, is correct, so you have proper strings, you parse the numbers, and you build some kind of tree data structure, so a document object model, right? Now, arguably, this is a little bit harder than parsing lines in the text file, so it should be a little bit slower. So how, how quickly can you go? Well, so if you pick uh, what might be, or certainly one of the very best JSON um, library in Java, Jackson, and if I use a, a pretty good benchmark file that uh, I've picked up uh, somewhere on the web, but that I use, uh, that I'm going to use throughout this talk, so it's twitter.json, was, um, was collected from the Twitter API and contains like numbers, um, Unicode string, and so forth. So it's a pretty good benchmark uh, because it's an all around uh, typical JSON file. I get that uh, Jackson can ingest the, uh, the, the, the JSON file at a fraction, about a third in my case. For, of course, the results will, will vary depending on your hardware but, and your software, but I, I post my, my source code. Um, so at about a fraction, about a third of a gigabyte per second. Uh, so we're very far from uh, maxing out our disk with a single core. So if we switch to uh, C++, then uh, a very, very, very good uh, library is RapidJSON. So if you're, if you're coding in, in C++ and you're processing JSON and you want really, really good performance and probably, probably you know about RapidJSON. So you do a little bit better. You reach, in this benchmark, you reach about two-thirds of a gigabyte per second. But again, you're very far from maxing out uh, the disk in this instance. So the question is, can you do it? That is, can you parse uh, JSON uh, at gigabyte speeds? And of course, you can. <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't be much of a talk. So, uh, <laughs> no, I have a bit more to go. OK. so. Um, so we built this library, SynDigison, um, that can achieve on this benchmark 2.4 gigabyte per second. Um, so it's actually the, the only library that I know of that I can actually max out my disk. Uh, and, and, and so just, just to think about what this means, uh, this means that on my test machine, roughly speaking, please don't do any math here, this is just an order of magnitude, it's about 1.5 cycles uh, per input byte, right? So this does not give you a lot of leeway. You cannot take each byte and start to think deeply about what to do with this byte and then switch to the next one. You only have 1.5 cycles per input byte. Now, it's a little bit better than it sounds, right? 
because our uh, super scalar processors can do many things uh, in, in, one, in one cycle, at least when they're not uh, doing uh, silly uh, random access work in memory or uh, other limitation. But when it's your CPU bound, you can certainly beat one instruction per cycle. So this is a bit better than it sounds. So how did we do it? Now I'm going to cover a few basic strategies that uh, probably most people here know, but I'm going to go a little bit more deeply in them, and then I'm going to show how, how we apply them. So uh, this was mentioned today uh, several times. People talk about measuring mispredicted branches and so on. But I'm going to uh, uh, go deeper into this and actually say that you should really work hard to avoid hard to predict branches. And I'm going to work from an example. So let's say, for example, you, you're trying to write random integers to an array. Right? So you do a, a silly loop. And if your random integers are generated using a fast, state-of-the-art pseudo-random uh, number generator, you might be able to do this task using about, say, three cycles per number generated. OK, now let's say you modify this job and you say, well, OK, I'm going, and, and, and this code here is silly, but this is just to illustrate my point. I'm going to do the same work, but I only want to write out uh, odd numbers, right? And I do it in the following manner. I generate my random uh, integer, and then I check whether it's odd. Now, this is very fast. I only have to check. Uh, the least significant bit. And if it is, I'm going to write it out. Now, if, 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 you're, if you're a bit naive about it, and if you're, if you're doing like textbook computer science, you might look at this and say, well, it's not necessarily any slower, and might even be faster than previous code because you're not writing uh, as much to, to the, the output array. Um, but actually, it's massively slower. Because what's happening here is that uh, the modern processor rely on uh, branch predictions, right? So each time, each time the, the processor sees a branch, it tries to predict its output several cycles ahead of time. And then it does the computation based on this prediction. If the prediction is false, then it needs to throw away all of this work and start, start again back uh, at the point where it mispredicted. And, and so in, I carefully designed my silly benchmark so that it would be clearly very difficult for the um, processor to uh, correctly predict the branch because it's got a random number and you know, how can it predict w whether it's odd or not? Now, thankfully, I can rewrite the same benchmark uh, without a branch. And typically, this is almost always possible. Um, so here's what I'm doing here, is that I'm always writing out, this is a typical trick, I'm always writing out the random, random integer to the array, but I only increment my uh, index when the uh, integer is odd. And in this code, there's no more branch. Well, actually, there, there's a branch due to the while loop, okay? But inside the, the, the while loop, there's no branch. And I've basically transformed a problem with a branch into one where it's just arithmetic. And the performance is back to nearly what it was originally. Now, what happens quite often is that uh, when you make this point to people, they write a little benchmark, and then they say, well, my, my code with branch is actually faster than your branchless code. Okay? And here's one scenario where this, that might explain what, what happens. If I take my code with the branch, the one I showed you, the silly one, and by design, I'm using a pseudo random number generator. So this means that I can repeat the benchmark many times, but it's always going to be the same random number. 
Now, to try to fool the, the processor, I can say, um, use a loop that has a 2,000 iteration. And if I do that, and I repeat and repeat always the iteration, uh, and I plot the misprediction rate. Initially, during the first iteration, I've got a 50% misprediction rate. But very quickly, the, the processor adapts and actually learn, and here I'm not kidding, it learned uh, the 2000 uh, prediction, and it can learn them pretty well. Now, this, this example with my uh, relatively old Skylake processor, it takes a really long time before it falls down to 1%, but uh, you see uh, after 50 trials, I'm down to 5%. If you use um, the new fancy AMD uh, processors, uh, in the same time, it falls down to 0.1%. Uh, apparently, there's something about deep learning or whatever, no, neural networks. It's not deep learning, but uh, anyhow, it's a very good branch uh, predictor. Um, so that, that's one problem, is that it's really hard to benchmark. Well, it's not very hard, but it's really hard to benchmark code with branches because uh, processors uh, do all sorts of crazy things to uh, fool you. Another fact that I'm not documenting here is that sometimes by adding a branch, you can worsen uh, the branch prediction elsewhere because basically the, the, it can depend on your processor, but lots of processors predict branches based on history. And if you're adding um, the history of the branches taken, and if, you, if you're adding a branch, then it's, this history gets uh, more, more complicated to learn. And so it can worsen things, even if the new branch that you've introduced is uh, predictable. So basically, branches can have bad effect, and these bad effects are not so easy to measure. Um, so I said earlier that I only have about uh, 1.5 cycles per byte. Uh, so this means I cannot go byte by byte when I process my, my, my input. I need to go with wide words, so maybe 64-bit words, or when possible, I should be using SIMD instructions. So SIMD instructions are, um, are, 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 have been around for a long time. They go back to Pentium 4. Uh, they, they were first introduced for well, as a motivation multimedia. Uh, sound, for example, and uh, now people, uh, people invoke machine learning and deep learning uh, as an application, but it's the same story. Basically, what they do is that they add wider registers. So the, the normal general purpose registers are 64 bits on most processors, uh, but then they add uh, 128, 256 bit, and even 512 bit uh, registers. They also add new fancy uh, instructions like uh, really quick, uh, really fast lookup uh, tables. So uh, basically the story goes like this. Your mobile phone, uh, your iPhone, for example, has a, a neon instruction, which, are, which use registered or span 128 bit. Uh, legacy, the same as legacy X64 processors. The more recent processors you can buy now uh, on your servers uh, use AV, uh, AVX and AVX2, so they use 256-bit registers. And our fancy, the fancy new uh, processors from Intel go up to 512-bit. Uh, for my work, for, for our work for Cindy Jason, we go up to, uh, uh, we use the first three um, type of systems. We did not yet go to uh, AVX 512. Part of it is that it's not very, it's not widespread yet. So how do you program for uh, SIMD instructions? Uh, the approach that we've been using for SIMD JSON is to use intrinsic functions. So this is, these are special functions that call sometimes a very specific instruction uh, that is specific to the processor you're using. There are higher level uh, uh, APIs, higher level functions, so Swift as them, C++. Uh, you've got the Java vector API that is uh, 
along these lines. We don't use that. You can also re rely on compiler magic. So your, um, your compiler, whether, whether it's in Java or C, can take a loop, for example, and vectorize it. It's like magic. Uh, and you can use some hand optimized functions. So Java has some of them. Uh, or you can, for example, when you use a crypto library, then these guys typically, they write uh, all of this stuff, all of their code in assembly, which I don't recommend because it gets a little bit difficult. Um, so another trick, which, again, nothing revolutionary, is that uh, you should avoid uh, memory and object allocation as much as you can. So in SimDigiton, we use uh, what we call a tape. So basically, when you're parsing uh, the JSON document, everything gets written to one tape uh, that's reusable. Reuse so whenever we encounter a string, we don't allocate memory for the string. Whenever we encounter a number, we don't allocate memory for the number. Everything gets written consecutively. Another strategy that we use is that we uh, measure the performance a lot. So, um, and we do what I would call benchmark-driven development. So, um, it might not be practical, but it's fun. So, uh, so, so here's a plot of our performance on the Twitter file on one mach specific machine over time. So on the x-axis, you've got the commits and on y-axis, you've got uh, the throughput. Now here I'm cheating a little bit because uh, uh, the, the y-axis does not start at, at, at zero. But I just wanted to show uh, what it looks like. And you can see we have these big jumps uh, when someone finds a new clever way to do things. Uh, so what's interesting is in our first public release, we, we reached two uh, gigabyte per second, and we thought we were uh, pretty clever. Uh, but now we're at 2.4, and I think we're going to go higher. I'm planning to go to at least 2.5, if not more. And also, we use um, uh, performance tests in our continuous integration. Now, that's, that's, that's a kind of warm in itself, but we try to basically detect uh, commits that uh, cause a major, major problem on one type of system very quickly. Uh, here's a... Uh, this is almost an aside, but here is a point that uh, I, I'm, I'm finding that I, I often have to do. So if you're doing CPU-intensive work, I'm not talking about accessing data in RAM or something like that, but if you're doing processor-intensive uh, work, then you have to worry about the fact that your processor, no matter what you think, the, your processor frequency is probably not constant, especially if you're working on a nifty new uh, laptop that's thin like this, um, it's probably not constant. Uh, and, and if you want to measure performance seriously, then you probably don't want to equate to time with the number of CPU cycles. So you have to use, and this was mentioned uh, today, uh, you need, probably need to use uh, performance counters from your CPU um, if you're serious about it. So uh, let me go into specific examples of what we do. So one problem that we have uh, when we want to parse uh, JSON is that the input, uh, the input in, in, at least on the web typically, is Unicode, so UTF-8. And we want to check that the bytes are actually UTF-8. So UTF-8 is a, an extension of ASCII, that is ASCII is valid UTF-8. Uh, but it adds uh, extra code points that span two, three, or, or four bytes. Uh, so clean, if you want to write in Klingon, for example, you're going to have to use more than one byte. But there are only about 1.1 million uh, valid code points. Everything else is garbage. And of course, you want to stop. Uh, you don't want to ingest strings that are not valid, because then it's going to end up in your database and maybe eventually in your on your website and God knows what. So you want to stop it right there. Now typically, uh, the way people validate uh, Unicode is with code like this. Now, this is not actual code. I took, well, I took real code and then I, I, I simplified it because it's much longer. But basically, it's a bunch of branches. 
Now, this works really fine if your input is ASCII because you've got one predictable branch and everything is fine. But the minute you, you start hitting uh, uh, Unicode, then you've got branch mispredictions all over. Now, you can avoid the branch misprediction by using a finite state machine and so on. It's complicated. But you can do even better than this. You can use SIMD instructions. So you, use, you load 32 bytes of data, you use 20 magical instructions, and then you've got no branch and no branch misprediction. I'm not going to, I don't have time to go into what these 20 something uh, instructions are, and they're actually, I know of three different strategies that end up with the same instruction cone, just, just about, but I'm just going to illustrate it. So, for example, in, in, in UTF-8, in, in the standard Unicode that we're, we see on the web, uh, no byte can be larger than two, no byte value can be larger than 244, right? And uh, the way we check this, well, you could just do a comparison, but f uh, we, we, we like to just do a saturated subtraction. So basically, we take the byte value and we subtract 244, and, um, and obviously, if it's not zero, if the result is not zero, then you have a value that's greater than 244. Otherwise, because of the saturation bit, it goes to zero. So saturation just means that it doesn't wrap around. It goes to zero if it's too small. And this can be written in code using one of these intrinsic functions I was talking to you about. So this one calls, uh, so this avoids assembly, but it's super ugly. Um, but in this case, with this one uh, uh, function, I can check 32 bytes at once. So it's really efficient, really fast. Uh, and then I could go on for about an hour to, uh, to explain how everything else falls into place. But let me jump to the results. So basically, uh, compared to branching, if I uh, have an input that's random uh, UTF-8, I'm about 20 times faster using uh, SIMD instructions than I am with using branching. So much better. Um, so let me work out here another fun problem that's m more closely related to uh, JSON. So in JSON, we have what uh, they call search all characters. I think the specification that calls them that. So the comma, the column, the column separates the key into values, and then the braces that differentiates between um, uh, objects and arrays. And then you have white space. And basically, outside the strings, you, you cannot have much else, right? You have the numbers, uh, you have the atoms, you have the numbers and all, but the structure is given by these uh, characters. So, so you want to identify them, but you don't want to identify them one by one. It's too slow. So we're going to build a lookup table approach. So what do we do is uh, we, we take each byte, each byte value, and we decompose it into two nibbles. So a nibble is four bit. So the least significant um, four bits, I'm going to call it the low nibble, and the most significant uh, four bits, I'm going to call it the high nibble. Now I'm going to use the fact that uh, whether you're using ARM or, or Intel or AMD, you have fast instructions that can, can, can do uh, table lookups as long as they're relatively small. So, um, let me, let me give you an example of what these instructions are capable of. So if I start with an array of uh, four-bit values, so nibbles, and I create a lookup table. Now here, for simplicity, my lookup table is just the numbers from 200 to 215, but this could be actually entirely random. I, I just, I just uh, use uh, the simple, because of course here I could just um, add uh, uh, 200 to, 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 uh, to, to do the lookup, but I, I wanted uh, something people could follow. So what I want to do here as a job, um, as a task, I want to map z 0 to 200, 1 to 201, and so on. And this, this task a, um, uh, can be done in one instruction. It's a really fast instruction on um, uh, most processors. So. That doesn't give me uh, the character classification I was talking about. 
But the recipe is actually quite simple. I need two lookups. So I take all my, my low linables and I look them up in one table and then I take all my high nibble and I look them up into another table and then I do the bitwise AND between the two. And then I choose my lookup tables carefully so that the comma ends up mapping to one, the column to two, the brackets to four, uh, and the white space characters to eight and 16. I'm going again to show you a terrible, really ugly code. So in this case, it's the implementation uh, using ARM Neon with uh, intrinsic functions. Now, it looks really, really scary, but it's not. So at, at the top, uh, I basically define my constants, which are my lookup table. So I've got two lookup tables. And then my five instructions are given below. So first, first two instructions identify the high and low nibbles. Then the instruction three and four are just lookups. And then the last instructions, I do a bitwise AND. So in five instructions, in this case, I can classify 16 characters without any branches whatsoever. It's super fast. Um, OK, here's a fun one. So you all know that if you want to put like a quote inside a string, you need to escape it, which means that you have to add a backspace before it. Now, backspace itself also needs to be escaped, of course. So it's backs backs backspace, backspace. Now, if I've got backspace quote, then it gets really confusing because it's backspace, 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 quote. And I could keep going. Now, in practice, this means that you could get uh, a JSON input that looks like this, right? And can you tell where, um, where the, the string starts, where they end? You don't know. So it's really hard to figure out the structure from this. Uh, but there's a trick, actually. So if you've got a, a not number of escape characters, uh, to, to, of backspace characters before a character, then this character is escaped. If you've got a, an even number, then you don't need to worry because an even number of backs, uh, backslash characters are just going to be mapped back to a series of backslashes. So let me uh, give you an example uh, of how we go about it. So I've got this, I go back to my input string. I identify the backslashes. So I map them to a, a bit set, right? Everywhere I've got a backslash, I put a one, otherwise I've got zeros. And then I'm going to define two constants. So the first one, uh, the first, you, you'll see where I'm going with this. Or maybe not, but it will be fun. Um, so I've got one constant where uh, I put a one at every uh, even index, so zero, two, and so forth. And I define another constant where I've got a one at every odd cons uh, uh, index, so one, three, and so forth. Okay, and then I plug in this formula at the very top. Okay, I'm not going to explain it. Okay, so uh, a student of mine asked me, "How did you get that?" So I said, "Well, lots of hard work." Um, <laughs> so, so if you got this formula here, you can just Try it out at home, it's fun. But um, Inia, this actually does the right thing. It, it, in, in this case, it will identify the, the fact that my quote character right there, okay, is escaped. So it, it's not actually a string delimiter uh, quote, right? And now, it sounds really painful. There's lots of instructions there. But again, no branches whatsoever. So if I remove the escape quotes, then the remaining quotes tell me where my strings are. So I can just identify my, all my quotes. So I put a one where I've got a quote. Then I, re, I, I identify my escape quotes. And then whatever remains are my string delimiter quotes. Now, it's important for me to identify where my quotes are when I'm parsing JSON, because if I want to, the structure of the document, right? 
I need to be sure that I remove all of the braces, the columns, and so on that are inside uh, strings because they don't count. Right? So I want to know where my strings are. So again, I do a little bit, a little bit of mathematical magic here. So if I start with where my, um, my quotes are, and I want to turn this into a, a bitmap that indicates the inside of my quotes, I can do a prefix XOR. I, I show you the code. Basically, I shift by one. I, I, I XOR with, with, with the, the original. I, I take the result. I, I shift it by two, and I XOR again, and so forth, and so forth. Now, this looks a little bit expensive, but you can actually do this with one instruction on most processors. So it's a curious multiplication. Uh, it's used for cryptography. So probably those of you who don't do crypto don't know about this instruction. But it's, this can actually be really, really cheap. And if you do this, you go from the location of the quotes to the string regions. This means I can mask out anything, any structural character that is inside of a quote. Again, without any branching. So, if you follow all of my example, if you put them together in your mind, you realize that the entire structure of the JSON document can be identified as a bit set, so with the ones and so forth, without any branch. Right? Um, so, at this point, you're going to have to uh, go from the, the, the bit set to the, the, to, to, to the locations of the ones. Okay? And so I've got a nice trick to, on how to do this, but uh, uh, let, me, let me jump ahead because I'm running a bit of the time is a little bit short, but maybe I can come back to it later. So. Um, Another, uh, another problem we, we have is that uh, number parsing is surprisingly expensive. So if you take uh, some Java code that has to ingest data that's in text form, and you try to benchmark the time spent parsing the, the, the floating point numbers, it's totally crazy. So I, I build a little benchmark. So I generated random uh, floating point numbers, and I just wrote them to a, uh, to a string in memory. And then I went back, and I tried to read back these, uh, these floating point numbers using a really you know, well-optimized C function, so uh, string 2D. Then I reached the fantastic speed of 90 megabytes per second. So, this is, this is slower than, not all disk, but this cer certainly should be slower than your SSDs. I would hope so. Uh, and I'm basically spending 38 cycles per byte, and I have a total of 10 branch misses per uh, floating point number. So this is not fun, and this is going to end up being a bottleneck. So basically, you will have to use either a fast uh, floating point uh, parsing library that someone wrote, or like we did, you, you write your own and you hope for the best. Uh, so, but I'm going to go back a little bit on my original strategy, which said, well, let's try to use wide words, right? So because again, you have the same problem. If you look at most code that parses uh, numbers, they do it byte by byte by byte. And this is, of course, not going to ever be super fast. So what we do here, again, I'm going to do some mathematical magic, and I'm not going to explain the formula. But here's, this is a formula I actually came up with, uh, probably working on late on a Saturday night. I don't know. Uh, so if you gave me eight um, ASCII characters or eight characters, uh, I take it and I map it to an, a 64-bit integer. I just copy it over, and then I apply this little formula, which is crazy. Uh, uh, then it's going to give me true when uh, my characters are, uh, are specifically eight digits. Right? Now, why is that important? 
because very often uh, what the numbers that are expensive to parse are numbers that are made of lots of lots of digits, right? So some people really like to throw in a lot of precision when they want to uh, when they want when they, they write when they serialize their data, and this is expensive to parse back. So uh, very often you want to speculate. You say, okay, maybe here I've got eight digits, and I want to be able to check it really, really quickly. So in this case, I'm able to use this formula. It's really, really cheap, only a few instructions, and I know right away wh whether I have eight digits. And if I do, then I've got a function to sell to you. So, so it's just, this one I did not invent. Um, so I picked that up on, on the web somewhere. Stack Overflow, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's probably where I picked it up. I don't know. Uh, there's credit for it uh, into the source code. Uh, and then what you want to do is you take these eight digits and you turn them into an integer. Right? But you don't do it character by character. You actually, uh, you actually do three multiplications and a few, and a, 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 few, um, a few arithmetic functions, and that's probably, that, that, that's, that's a total sum of it. And so I'm not going to go into everything else we do for full parsing, but this gives you an idea of the strategy. Okay, so when you, when you write Java code or use a, a JIT, so forth, you don't. You often don't have a problem where you don't know. Um, you don't know about the hardware you're running on. Um, but we are doing uh, optimization that are really low level that are specific to the hardware. So we add, we do some uh, optimizations for processors that have um, 200, 256 bit registers, and then uh, to support legacy hardware we need to also have 128-bit uh, registers. So we basically need two uh, functions for, well, and then we, we support also ARM, but that's, that's a little bit easier because it's, uh, the, the ESA is more, a little bit more stable. But we have, um, we, we, we have to support um, basically two, uh, on, on Intel and M MD processors, we have to support two code paths. So the way we, we do it is fairly standard. Uh, so we, uh, we basically uh, uh, build and compile two functions, and then we do what uh, they call runtime dispatch. So the first time the, function, the parsing function is called, uh, it's actually calling a special function that should be called only once. Uh, there's concurrence involved, but uh, I, I, I removed it from the code for simplicity. So you check the, the feature of the CPU, and then you branch, depending on, on, uh, on the function you want to use. And then you basically reassign the pointer, the function pointer. So the next time, there's, there's not going to be any CPU checking, because you're assuming that the person running your program is not switching the CPU under you. Um, and, 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 and so you're going to call the write function right away. Now, uh, I've known about, about runtime dispatch for a long time. Uh, and everyone says it's super easy. And, but then when you ask around, you find out that few people have actually tried to implement it. And when you try to implement it uh, using uh, portable uh, code as much as possible, so that it runs under Visual Studio, uh, Clang, and GCC, uh, we found it really, really hard to do, in part because there are bugs in, in some of, of these compilers, and there were, there were no good model on how to do it. Uh, because uh, of the, uh, one of our objectives was to have a single header library, so we don't want to depend, we, we don't know how people are going to build our code, so we don't want to depend on a build system, we really want the code to do all of the, 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 the work. So for this reason, this was a little bit, uh, uh, a bit hard. Now obviously, if you're, 
if you're working in Java, say, then you don't have, don't have to worry about that because someone else is worrying about it for you. But uh, so uh, so SimDJSON is a um, well, it's a free library. It's available on GitHub. Where else? Uh, so it's a it's a single header library. Uh, so it's really really easy to integrate. You can just plug it in your system. Uh, it's relatively modern uh, C++. One of my students says that it's, it's advanced C++. Uh, it's, it's, we, 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 we support uh, different hardware. So we support uh, ARM. Uh, there's even someone who, um, there's, uh, there, there's a co-author that actually wrote a version for, um, uh, for Swift uh, that, that acts as a wrapper for our stuff and it beats uh, Apple's uh, parser. Uh, uh, and then we support relatively old uh, uh, Intel and AMD processors. Uh, it's uh, under an Apache uh, license. There's no patent, because I'm, I'm poor and stupid. And, uh, and uh, it, it's used by reasonable people at, at Microsoft and, and Yandex. Uh, we have wrappers in Python, PHP, C Sharp, Rust, uh, JavaScript, Ruby. Uh, there are ports also, very exciting. So there are ports to Rust. So there's a version that runs that's written entirely in Rust, but there's a bit of, uh, you know, apparently the keyword uh, unsafe was used. Uh, there, there, there's, there's an ongoing port to Go, and uh, there's a C Sharp port also. Uh, no Java port, uh, sadly, that's missing. Uh, okay, so we have an academic, academic reference, so it uh, was published in VL, the VLDB journal. Um, and I'm, I'm going to end with some credits. So a lot of the really, uh, not all of them, but a lot of the clever magical, um, magical algorithms with really hard to, you know, really crazy formulas were, were, were uh, designed by uh, Jeff Langdale, who's uh, my primary co-author. But uh, also, uh, there's lots of contributors. Well, this is, this is GitHub. This is, we're in 2019. So uh, when you post something on the web, everyone uh, comes to help you sometimes. And, uh, and also, well, I'm going to conclude with the fact that I've got free stickers for people who want, to, who want them. And I'm going to end there. <laughs>